we're here at uh, the home of some of the greatest films that have been made. Um, you, Mr. John Williams, have uh, given us the music for a hell of a lot of those films. What you do is actually possibly one of the hardest jobs in the world, to create music out of nowhere, out of nothing. Is my job the hardest job in the world? I've never laid bricks, <laughs> so I, I don't know if it is or not. Uh, but writing music is, is, one has to be prepared to do the hard work, that's certainly true. Mm. But it's a joyous occupation. It is about music, and uh, I've often said that music for musicians is like oxygen, you know, it's what what sustains us. I've changed a lot, though, in the last 15, 20 years, where now I'm having fun, it, truly. <laughs> Writing for film music is very difficult. I don't know if it's as hard as laying bricks, but it's very demanding uh, arithmetically, let's put it that way, from second to second almost in some cartoon-like situations or action situations where the music is constantly shifting modalities very quickly. I, I would say it's probably not a profession for all composers because it's very, it can be very constricting and very, very um, possibly very frustrating to, to where a phrase can't be extended because there simply isn't time to do it and it's got to be reduced to something like this. So is it a hard job? Yes. Is it a pleasant job and rewarding job? Yes. I want to talk a little bit about the opportunities that film offers a composer, particularly in the sense of the audience that it, it, that it offers a composer, that you may write a tune that would sit in the drawer for decades. It can, become, it can find a life of its own, an audience of not millions, but possibly billions of people. So film, uh, f for the art of music, has been a life changer. Film composing is only 80 years old or 90 years old now. It's a very young, you play Baroque music on your network that's 400 years old and it's as fresh today as it was then. Yeah. This is the very beginning of, a, of, a, of an artistic medium that was, was going to develop in ways that I wish I could be around to see. And hear. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution without change without passion and without logic. It lives to kill. What I find interesting listening to, because I love listening to, to music from films, uh, old and new, um, this idea that one very, very simple idea which rises to the top, and in, and, and in this case I am, I am talking about Jaws, the, the, the making of Jaws, very well known that Steven Spielberg was having a lot of mechanical trouble whilst the shark wouldn't work in the water. So it was a practical, literally practical, it wasn't an artistic decision. It just got lots of salt inside it and it just wouldn't work. So it wasn't scary. So what happened? Well, we'll get John Williams to come in and see what he's got to do. And you sat down effectively and created one of the most recognisable and, and useful pieces of music, film music, that has ever been put onto uh, notation paper. Um, how... Did you feel that you were about to be turned into uh, some kind of superhero after this because of what happened by, by, the, by the simplicity and the smallness of that durdum, durdum motif? Well, of course, I, I, at, at, at that time, I had no idea that, that it would have that kind of impact on people. Uh, Stephen and I had a little laugh about it. Uh, initially, I, just, I did a score for Robert Altman called Images, which was all about Japanese uh, sounds and uh, shakuhachi and percussion and so on. And that's the music that Stephen thought he should have something for Jaws, something with that complexity and all that dissonance and so on. And 
I thought that that was a crazy idea, but this was a simple adventure thing, and I need to find some musical theme or, or idea that might represent the shark or might represent our primordial fear of, of like we fear snakes, we fear beasts of the, of the sea. And he came to my room at Fox Studios and he, what are you going to do for the shark? And I played E, F, E, F, E, F, D, F. It's all. <laughs> and, and, and he said, you can't be serious. I said, well, I think when the basses and celli of the orchestra, maybe once in a while supported by timpani or contrabassoon, you might be convinced that this is scary enough. Uh, let's try it. It, it. it worked particularly well because it could be very soft. Which is, is, you know, the softer we played it, the scarier it seemed to be, and and even though we still separate the bow at the frog, so to speak, your listeners will know some of them play strings, and and then it could be it could rise up to a thunderous kind of noise, and the speed could be changed. It could be very slow, like this, and go up to a very quick tempo. So it was a useful thing to sort of advertise what you might call in the film industry a red herring, presenting a threat that isn't really there and delivering the, the information that it wasn't a shark but a beer can. But the music made you, as you're, you're approaching the beer can, you, you feel the shark is with you and you discover that, ah, it's a, again with quotes and hyphenated red herring, a surprise. So it was useful as a tool, uh, but it never had any... I never had a thought in my mind, and I don't think Stephen did either, that it would be that, have that forceful effect on an audience. But when you think back, now, of course, I can rationalize it and try to, in a pseudo way, intellectualize what it what might be, that it, that, it, that it rattles something in the reptilian cortex, which is, what, which is the area where our, we have our basic fears of reptiles or whatever, and, and that it rattles something in the human fear chain but when I was playing E, F, E, F, D, F on the piano, I wasn't thinking about the primordial fear chain. <laughs> and yet there it that was. That came later. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can, you can always look back and the say, oh, thing, yes, this is what I was trying to do. The only thing more scary would have been if the film was not a success. <laughs> well, yeah, that does yeah. make quite a big difference. leading me on to Star Wars and that's something which you have never really let go of you, 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 you wanted to be there every time the next Star Wars installment was put together and that's quite an unusual thing you know you'd think that somebody might get slightly tired of having done one and then two and then three well I, I've, I've done nine of them I, 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 I think that's the last of them I, I don't know but I, I, it was a nice opportunity because I, I don't think it's ever a composer's had an opportunity in film at least to write sequels where you could add two or three themes to each score and end up with a glossary of 45 themes for nine films, you know. And I, I, I wanted to keep, have it all in my hand, frankly, as long as I could have the energy to do it and enjoyed all of it. And the recent ones, I particularly enjoyed J.J. Abrams' The Force Awakens, which I loved. And I loved your British lady, uh, Daisy Ridley, who I, who I thought did such a fabulous job in the comedy scenes and the action scenes and so on. And she moved like a trained athlete, fabulous actress. Great contribution to that film. So I have to credit George Lucas. In the first the case of the first film, George was just saying, this film is taking us to realms unseen and, and that the music somehow should be an, ground us emotionally. It should have some kind of a classical, if you like, or 19th century rootedness that would be orally familiar when we're in a visually unfamiliar uh, atmosphere. And I think it was a brilliant notion, uh, and uh, I did the best I could to, uh, to write the sort of ceremonial kind of fanfare that it needed, we, I thought, in the beginning, and the throne room march at the end. And so when we talk about Star Wars and the impact of the opening march. We have to talk about the London Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, why not? Because, why not? They, because they performed it. But the first morning of the first day of recording of the first Star Wars was the first service of Morris Murphy, the famous trumpeter, principal trumpeter of the London Symphony Orchestra. 
And the first note he played with the orchestra was that high C that begins the fanfare, picked right out of the air, which he never missed. And I, I think a lot of the thrill of that opening chord that the world seems to love uh, is directly owed to the brilliance of Morris, the late Morris Murphy. I would say that, uh, that for a lot of people, the fanfare from Star Wars, the big fanfare, uh, is one of a lot of people's favourite piece of film music. I, I don't know how I don't know how you did it, but you did it. There again, I have to say that that we walked away from the studio feeling that we had a nice film that audiences would enjoy, take their kids to for a couple three weeks, and then we roll it over and we do the next film there. Now we had no idea that that this thing would be created, a, a, a thing that time would ignore, however you describe that, and still be with us forty or fifty years later. Something about the imp the imprint on the on the brain that music seems to make. It's almost like the scent, the olfactory thing. You pick up a scent and you remember your mother cooking a certain thing. And you and you hear a tune and you remember your father smoking a certain brand of cigarette or something like this. Powerful connections that's, that live with us. If if you think of music as a as an as a living thing. I love the way you describe it, that once it's released from the composer's pen, it's out there, it's alive, is the way you, you're thinking, thinking of it. And it's still there. Whatever Tchaikovsky has written, whatever Schoenberg has written, it's still alive and with us. They've created something, it doesn't go away. I want to be grateful for all of us, if I can put it that way, for music itself. You and I are talking, we're, right now we're in Los Angeles. You're from Great Britain. What has brought us together? Music. Yeah. That's the reason we're together in this room, not because of airplanes or of cameras or any of your technology, but music. What little I can possibly contribute with my little scores, nothing compared to the work of Bach or Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, any of the, the great colossal geniuses that developed uh, the music that in our Western uh, sphere holds so dear. To our, as our, one of the foundations of our culture. Why do we insist that people need music everywhere in the world? We want to support our orchestra, support our opera and ballet company and so on, because we believe that it's, it's part of our spiritual lives and without it, we're, we're the poorer. <laughs> I wanted to talk about uh, Indiana Jones. You've have you have you completed the the score for the new Indiana Jones no, film? No, no. Did, did did you contribute to it? Thirty percent of the way, I would say. Right. I pretty much have the thematic scheme mm. uh, done, but we probably will be working on this into September. Right. Okay. And we're, you, we and I are talking now. Where are we? July, early mm. July. Yeah. So some weeks to, of work to go. Still, is it? What what we all need to know is that you're still in there, still in there, <laughs> fighting, you know, coming up with things that nobody else has come up with, uh, which is part of the deal. We we were also talking uh, about Superman, because now there are so many superheroes. I mean, just uh, much darker now. It's a completely different kind of yes. style, yeah. but not not the original Superman mm -hmm. uh, as uh, Christopher Reeves played, mm -hmm. um, which was a which completely changed the course of comic book movies. And we could believe that a man could fly. Right. When, when an orchestra can play Superman, for example, I'm very happy. <laughs> after how many years, 40 or 50 yeah. years and so on, that the music is still alive and still held in some uh, appreciative uh, way of, or form with people. Um, yeah, younger audiences. <clears throat> I, can, I remember in, in Boston, a concert experience that we'd have, we would play a march by Berlioz or a march by Ducat, whatever it would be. You know? and, and the young people, they were, little, they were 8 and 10, 12 year olds, the young people's concert, they wouldn't react. But we'd play Superman March and they all know it. They all, they all could, they came alive, they understood the context or whatever the relationship in the music. Very rewarding to me. It's a, a wonderful thing. <laughs> Uh, I went 
to a cinema to see um, what the, I think the third Harry Potter film. And I've never seen kids, because they were really small, some of them, absolutely transfixed on everything that was being said and shown to them. And obviously, they, as soon as they heard the, the opening chimes, uh-huh, yes. must be must be incredibly gratifying to know that something small, yes, and and not slight, but you know something yes. easily understood, can, will literally go on. It is very gratifying, and the feeling that a connection can be made with a short phrase or a, sh- a short comment. I suppose it's like language in a way. If you can control language and shape a three or four sentence line, it will, it's more effective to people than, than uh, 20 minutes of oration. Uh, power of simplicity, of directness. Uh, we can't always do it. It's, it, it's uh, something, something, of, something of a miracle, I think, in a way, of communication. All part of our humanity, all part of music making, all so exciting. And uh, it will go on, it's been with us, with our humanity from the very beginning of our existence. And even if we lose the ability to speak, we'll still have be humming tunes. Right now, we're, we're, I don't know, a few yards from where I work. And I'll, as I leave you and, and thank you, I will go to work on something, and I think it's real six of Indiana Jones, part five. Real six, (laughs) yeah. And that will be with me the rest of the day. (laughs) Uh, But I hope this has been uh, enjoyable for you. It certainly has been for me. Uh, John, it really is an absolute pleasure, Uh, more than just a pleasure. It's a privilege. I feel very, very flattered and grateful that you would do that.